it is good to be back here at Central and to be with you in worship and to lead you in God's word this morning as we prepare to hear our scripture lesson that we'll be reflecting on. Please pray with me. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Speak, O Lord, for we love you and your word through Christ Jesus, the word made flesh. Amen. Turning to the book of Psalms this morning, to Psalm 47 specifically, the 47th Psalm. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God is King over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham For the shields of the earth belong to God, for he is highly exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Well, one of the most mind-boggling spectacles I've ever seen is a short science movie titled Powers of Ten. Many of us no doubt saw this movie probably at a high school physics class. More recently, a a new version of this came out for IMAX called Cosmic Voyage, and it's narrated by God himself, which is to say Morgan Freeman. But both films accomplish the same thing, and in the case of the original movie I saw in high school, the first scene shows a close-up view of a young couple spreading out a picnic blanket on a grassy section of Chicago's Grant Park. Then, every 10 seconds thereafter, the camera pulls back, each time increasing its distance from the couple by a power of 10. First, the camera pulls back just one foot. 10 seconds later, it has pulled back 10 feet. 10 seconds later, 100 feet, and then 1,000 feet, and then 10,000 feet, and so on. Now, at first, you can still see the young couple, but soon you can pick out only the small square of their picnic blanket in the midst of the larger Grant Park. Seconds later, Grant Park has been reduced to a small green patch, as now you can see all of Chicago and the southern curve of Lake Michigan. Next, Chicago disappears, as you can see the whole United States. Then you see the whole planet Earth. Then even our own sun starts to shrink to an ordinary looking star. And within just a couple of minutes, the camera has pulled back to the outer limits of the Milky Way galaxy and thereafter soon to the edge of the known universe. And once the edge of space is reached, the camera then quickly hurtles back through space, finally zooming back in on the couple on their picnic blanket in Grant Park. All in all, the film is a stunning reminder of how small we are in the vastness of the larger universe. Well, on this Christ the King, or or, or Reign of Christ Sunday, I invite you to take a similar trip of the imagination. But let's begin somewhere out in the vastness of space, and then let's start start to zoom in. We, We enter the bright spiral of our Milky Way galaxy, zooming past millions of bright suns. Then we enter our own solar neighborhood, zipping past Pluto, the rings of Saturn, the red planet Mars, and finally seeing the bright blue marble of the Earth. Then we narrow our focus down to Europe and and Africa, descending more specifically to the Mediterranean basin. Finally, we see the region of Palestine, focusing on the country of Israel, itself no larger than Vermont. Then we move down to the modest city of Jerusalem, to the little hill called Mount Zion, and finally we come in for a landing at Solomon's Temple long about the year 900 B.C. 
And then having made this cosmic voyage to this little pinprick on the earth, we witness a group of ancient Israelites singing Psalm 47 and thereby declaring to all who hear, this temple is the center of the universe. This is the throne of the Most High God, of Yahweh, who is so mighty, so exalted, and so great that from this location on Mount Zion, he rules every nation, every king, every speck of the cosmos. Now, from the outside looking in, uh, we cannot help but see this claim as ridiculous. It seems the height of audacity. Even if you limited your gaze to the then-known world, Israel was a very small, middling nation compared to the vast empires of Persia and Egypt, compared to the splendor of Babylon's hanging gardens and Egypt's soaring pyramids. Israel was just a pimple on the face of the earth. So on what possible basis could the Israelites claim that they alone mattered? that they alone were the headquarters of the sovereign king of all creation. And yet there it is in Psalm 47. Israel shouts its ardent belief that they are the theological center of the universe. Now most scholars think uh, that Psalm 47 was sung when, as part of a worship service probably, the, the Ark of the Covenant got carried up into the temple. That's probably why verse 5 refers to God's ascending amid shouts of joy. Since the ark was God's throne on earth, seeing it ascending into the temple was the same as seeing God going up. The only true God lived in Jerusalem and was in charge from there of every other ruler on the earth. Now, when we read Psalm 47, we we see lovely poetry that, that gives expression to our faith. But if back then you had been uh, the, some atheistic king in Babylon, uh, or if you were the pharaoh in Egypt, yourself regarded as a god by the Egyptian people, well then Psalm 47 would hardly strike you as lovely. How dare those puny Israelites huddle together in their pathetic little capital city and then point their fingers at the rest of the world to say, you're nothing. Our God could buy and sell you. You, O mighty Pharaoh of Egypt. You, O lofty emperor of China. You, O exalted king of Persia. You are all the property of our God. Now, of course... Within the confines of Israel, the people didn't have much opportunity to see the Egyptians or the Babylonians getting upset about such rhetoric. I mean, international communication was pretty minimal back then. Israel's worship services were not beamed via satellite to other nations. Israel didn't have its own Facebook page where they posted such claims as their status updates. Nobody was sending out tweets for hashtag Zion is king. So it's possible that the people who would be the most offended by the claims of the 47th Psalm never really heard them. But today, our situation is vastly different. These days, we live in an international marketplace of ideas and religions. Now, what we Christians think about Jesus does get put into print and get distributed far and wide. And what's more today, you don't even need to leave home to encounter people of other ethnic and religious backgrounds. Attend any major university and your roommate is as likely to be a a Buddhist as a Methodist. Have a donut and a cup of coffee in the break room at work and the co-worker sitting across from you could as well be a Hindu as a Roman Catholic. And none of those people is really going to like it if you present them with some version of Psalm 47. You know, at the interfaith Uh, worship services that often follow things like the tragic shooting in Newtown or the Boston Marathon bombing, the Christian pastor or the Jewish rabbi who participates in the service is always welcome to read Psalm 46 
In fact, Psalm 46 almost always gets read at those services. It's such a comforting psalm. You know, God is our refuge and strength. But if anyone at one of those services just bumped up a psalm and started to read Psalm 47, well, the spirit of religious unity might unravel live on CNN. And yet here we are, still in the year 2021, gathered for worship to do really what we do every week. We come here to sing and to shout and to proclaim our New Testament version of Psalm 47 by proclaiming that our Jesus is King. Jesus ascended to God's right hand and is right now the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the President of Presidents and the Prime Minister of Prime Ministers. Jesus reigns. Jesus is in charge whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not. Jesus is the one in so cosmic and galactic a sense as to offend anybody looking for only mushy, half-mumbled affirmations that all religions are equally true. If what we came together to sing about this morning is true, then every faith system and every religion and every person who claims the cosmos has a different king is wrong, period. These aren't modest claims, because if our claims are true, they affect everybody. If our claims are false, then nobody could say, well, at least their little Christian faith is meaningful for their little lives. No, if we're right, we're right, and no one is excluded. And if we're wrong, we're wrong so devastatingly as to pretty much evacuate most of the, if not all of the meaning from our faith. Jesus is king we say on this Christ the King Sunday and every week. But you know, Jesus cannot be king kinda, sorta, more or less here and there now and then depending on your point of view. It's like some scientist who grabbed headlines by claiming my calculations show that our sun will go supernova in exactly six months, evaporating all matter from the center of the sun out to the orbit of Mars. Now, a person cannot be just a little bit right or a little bit wrong about a claim like that. I mean, some claims brook no middle ground. And claiming the reign of Christ is telling the world how we see things. It's how we see all things. Now, of course, believing that we're not just locally right about Jesus as king, but universally so, that does not give us license to go around and abuse or bash those who disagree with us. But a claim as grand as we make on this day is going to have to have some pretty big effect. So what might that be? Well, perhaps we are called to do the same thing the Israelites were called to do 3,000 years ago. Namely, live as authentic witnesses to what we believe to be the truth. We too have to acknowledge that, that what we say and when we say what we sing every Sunday when we gather here in our little churches, it looks ridiculous. If it's centers of power and influence you're looking for, well check out Hollywood, Wall Street, Washington, DC. Even as Israel did not look like the center of the universe way back when, so the average church doesn't look like much today either. The story is told that near the end of World War II, Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin were observing a military parade of of tanks and infantry units. At one point, Churchill mentioned to Stalin that he was hoping that perhaps the Pope could be helpful in putting Europe back together after the war. Stalin leaned over and cynically said, oh yes? Well, how many divisions does the Pope have? Most of our world cannot conceive of power in any other way. The only power some people recognize is the power that comes from the barrel of a gun. At the outset of the film Grand Canyon, a young street tough from south central Los Angeles is roughing up a motorist whose car had stalled on the gang's turf. When a black tow truck driver arrives to bail the motorist out, he begins to bargain and plead with the head of the street gang, asking that they let the motorist go unharmed. 
And at one point, the thug asks the tow truck driver, you bargaining with me because you respect me or because I got a gun? And the tow truck driver answers truthfully, hey, you don't have the gun, we ain't talking. Heh, that's what I thought, the thug says. That's why I always carry the gun. Well, the church doesn't carry a gun, or it isn't supposed to, though some comments by some religious leaders lately make you wonder if everybody really knows that. We don't have divisions of tanks. We don't have that kind of clout or power, nor, by the way, should we want it. We're like Mount Zion of old, little pinpricks dotting the landscape of a much larger world. And worse, it's a world whose headlines almost every day seem calculated to challenge the idea that the world is in charge by any kind of a good lord or king. Some years ago, when the worst of Rwanda's genocide was taking place, as one ethnic group hacked another to pieces with machetes, Time magazine featured a quote from a UN observer on its cover, and the quote was, there are no devils left in hell, they are all in Rwanda. But when was the last time there was such a sustained outbreak of goodness on this planet that it caused someone to say, there must be no angels left in heaven because they're all here on earth? No. No, ours is a world of hatred and strife of children shooting children on playgrounds, of cancer and leukemia, of homegrown terrorists shooting up campuses and Christmas parties. It doesn't look like a world ruled by a good king. How then can we claim the truth of reign of Christ Sunday, the truth that Jesus is king and we are his people, that the church, all appearances to the contrary, really is very much in touch with the theological center of the universe? How can we do this? We can do it only by letting our own lives bear witness to our ardent faith. We can do it only if Christ as cosmic king is how we see things, is the lens through which we view the world, the nightly news, our decisions, our lifestyle choices, our everything. We have to let the Holy Spirit move us to live Jesus' kingship as consistently and boldly as we can. The shape of our lives needs to make Jesus as king more credible, not less so. Because in the end, it doesn't really matter how ridiculous we look when we sing sentiments like the ones in the 47th Psalm. To those who are only and always on the outside looking in, faith always looks absurd. What does matter, however, is that if anyone bothers to get to know you, if anyone looks your life over more thoroughly to check out your professional conduct, your home life, your choices in the entertainment field, your care of the environment, your conduct as a friend or a spouse or a parent, if anybody scrutinizes all of that, then it matters very much that what they see in you is transparent to the truth of Jesus as king. The church and our lives in it need to be the one place where his kingship is visible. And by grace it can be. And by grace it is. This isn't an impossible task for us because in the end, It isn't a task at all. It's who we are by grace. We're drenched in the Spirit's presence now, and as a result of that divine gift, everything changes. God has given us a new identity in Christ, and now the Holy Spirit empowers us every day to live out that faith in every way. The reign of Christ is how we see things because in our baptisms we were given a new set of eyes. In Maya Angelou's classic essay, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, we see a vignette of what such new eyes may mean when we see Jesus as king. Set in the South back in the late 1940s, The essay tells of a time when Maya Angelou's mama was taunted and insulted by a group of white girls 
while Mama was doing no more than just sitting in a rocker on the porch of the small grocery store they ran. The girls said nasty things to Mama, laughed at her for being black, One 13-year-old girl even did a handstand so as to let her dress fall down. She wasn't wearing any underwear, and so she mooned Mama with her bare bottom in front. And watching her Mama, young Maya was furious that Mama didn't do something, say something. Yet Mama remained calm, and as Maya moved a little closer, she could hear Mama singing softly, Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Well, the girls tired of the show eventually and left. And as Mama left the porch to return to the store, Maya heard her singing again. Glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down. Glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down. See, Mama could see deeper farther than just those nasty girls and their despising of her. She saw the king high and lifted up, and it changed everything. You know, we open this sermon thinking about how quickly we can be dwarfed by the vastness of this universe. Given how big the cosmos is, isn't it a bit audacious to claim that that we have some corner on ultimate truth? And yet, we believe we do precisely because in our faith, we know how the cosmic can touch us in our tininess. Because as we begin to celebrate in Advent once more, starting a week from today, we know that once upon a time, God's own son took his own cosmic powers of ten journey. Long ago, the son of God zipped past galaxies, quasars, suns, planets, and continents, getting ever closer to our world until finally he dove deeply into the confines of a young woman's uterus. And there, as a microscopic zygote, he took on human DNA and cells and organs and blood, and he was born in a small stable, all his vastness contained by no more than a goat's small feed trough. Never before had the cosmic and the local, the vastness of God and the smallness of a single human being commingled in so marvelous a way. And that is the God and Lord we serve. That is why we can be so sure that despite our smallness, God is with us and does great things through us. As the psalmist knew, this is a gospel too grand to be watered down. It needs to be sung with loud voices to the sounds of trumpets, inviting the whole world to sing, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to the king upon his throne, sing praises to God, sing praises, for he is highly exalted. Hallelujah and amen. Please pray with me. Lord, our God and King, for your great love for us, for touching us and noticing us despite our smallness, for making yourself small so you could be close to us, we give you the glory both this day and even forevermore. Amen.